Welcome to Hope is Here. My name is Greg Horn, and obviously we love to provide hope for you, but obviously to have hope, we uh, want to help have you faith. And I'm excited about an author that we're going to have with us. He's written a book on faith. It's called Resurrected Faith, The Heart of a Contender. It's by Greg Eby. So, Greg, thanks for joining us today on Hope is Here. Hey, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be your guest. Well, obviously, uh, man, faith's been such a journey and a battle over the past couple of years with COVID and just so many crazy things going on in our world. Uh, you call your book Resurrected Faith, the Heart of a Contender. What does a faith resurrection look like in your mind? Yeah, well, you know, um, uh, the writer of Hebrews tells us what faith is, that faith is the substance of things hoped for. And so if our faith is weak or dying then we're going to have a hope that is struggling as well. And uh, most people are not aware of the fact because believers are sleepwalking through life and don't realize that we are facing a spiritual pandemic of dead faith with far greater consequences than the COVID epidemic that uh, we've gone through. You know, we could cover our faces and and, uh, try to keep ourselves from getting uh, physically sick, but uh, unfortunately, the uh, disease of dead faith is something that crosses denominational boundaries and knows no limits. And uh, we need to be aware that the Holy Spirit is sending out a wake-up call so that our faith will come to life. And in turn, uh, when we have a living, active faith, we're going to have a renewed hope, uh, greater peace, joy, love. All of those things are kind of rolled into one. Well, I do love that verse in Hebrews uh, about faith, and that's the main reason we do hope is here is to help people grow in their faith and to continue to have it uh, each day. In your book, you describe how the Holy Spirit used a personal sickness to reveal uh, the dead faith you carried around in your life. Uh, what are some of the symptoms of dead faith that we should look for? Yeah, you know, um, uh, having surgery was not on my bucket list of things to do, but uh, I woke up with a stabbing pain that uh, over the next couple of days came to uh, be told, yeah, I've got to have my gallbladder removed. And instead of the typical uh, hour-long laparoscopic surgery, I ended up with the old-fashioned, you know, uh, six-inch scar across my uh, abdomen. And so that meant four days of recovery. And so the Holy Spirit used my experience of uh, what happened physically to show me that, hey, son, you have some uh, issues in your life spiritually. At that time, I was active in the ministry as a full-time pastor and, you know, just engaged in doing lots of, of ministry activities and things, and so you wouldn't think that a pastor has dead faith. And I want to encourage our listeners to understand that when I talk about dead faith, I'm not talking about our saving faith. Uh, we are saved by faith in Christ. That's not by works or anything that we do. It's what He's done for us. And so dead faith talks about how we respond to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, and are we actively living out what uh, we believe. And so those symptoms include things like pain. Uh, that was the first thing that, you know, it woke me up at uh, 3 o'clock in the morning. And, you know, when we think about uh a pain that tells us, hey, you are suffering with a dead faith. Uh, oftentimes, you know, if people are lacking hope, if they uh, are struggling and saying, you know, there's got to be more than this, they're just going through the religious routine of life, but there's an emptiness, a longing for more. That's a pain that should be a sign, hey, don't ignore this. You need to, to look to the Lord. We then, in turn, sometimes over-medicate our pain. And I know as a, as a busy pastor, I was guilty of that. I was on the spiritual narcotic of ministry activity. And even people who are just serving in the church, maybe as a Sunday school teacher or a deacon, uh, whatever it might be, we get engaged in doing lots of good things, and it takes our mind away from spending time with Jesus and allowing Him to talk to us about the condition of our faith. Uh, and then a third is blame, uh, that we want are, are sometimes quick to point a finger and accuse other people, or maybe we blame God or we blame the devil. 
uh, because we don't want to take our personal responsibility. So those are three quick highlights of some of those symptoms. And again, as we, as we think about it, it really is a time that the Holy Spirit wants us to examine our lives. It's easy for us to, again, say, oh yeah, I can see how faith is, is uh, a, a pandemic in the Church and that other people are struggling with that, but we need to start with looking at ourselves and allow the Holy Spirit to uh, resurrect our faith personally. Just tuned in. We're talking with author Greg Eby. He has written a book called Resurrected Faith, The Heart of a Contender. Uh, Greg, you know, you also wrote uh, about a resurrection of simple truth to understand faith as a verb. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, we, we, we use faith a lot. When we think about faith, we think of faith in terms of a noun. And a noun is something that we can pick up, we can do something with it, and we can act upon faith. Uh, and it's something that we are doing. But, but again, we're not saved by faith as a work, but it's a gift of God. And so faith, we need to understand it as a verb. And the Holy Spirit just reminded me that in both the Old and the New Testaments, faith uh, the, the Hebrew and Greek words that originate our understanding of faith are both verbs. And we need to realize, hey, faith is not something that we are doing, but it is the work of faithing, or the activity of faithing, as I call it in the book, that it's the Spirit energizing our faith so that it affects our beliefs. Um, I really liked the uh, Hebrew understanding of the basis of faith. It comes from the Hebrew uh, word aman, and uh, it's first used, of course, to describe the faith that Abraham had, that by that Abraham believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. But what did it mean for Abraham to believe the Lord? Well, that root word talks about how his faith was something that he was finding support in the Lord. And I like Isaiah 22, 23, that really best illustrates that word, Haman. It's that the Lord is saying, I will uh, uh, plant him like a tent peg in a secure place. And secure place is that verb. Again, it sounds like a noun to us, but that secure place is holding the tent peg. Uh, think about Jesus' example of the sermon from the Sermon on the Mount of the wise and the foolish builder. We can either put our tent peg and allow the Lord to put it into a secure place that when the winds blow and everything, hey, that house is going to stand, the tent's not going to blow away, or it can be in sandy soil, and we end up realizing, hey, there's a lot of destruction, pain, and unexpected things that come into our lives, but He wants our faith to support, to uphold uh, us so that, uh, again, we are being transformed from the inside out. It is active and doing something within us. Amen. You talked about the use this idea of the number four and the equation two plus two equals four to illustrate contending for the faith and not a faith among many. Uh, explain the Christian struggle for just one faith. Yeah, you know, um, uh, the theme of the book comes from uh, Jude uh, verse three, that we need to earnestly contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And when we think about faith, one way that it's used is that it's used to describe the teaching and doctrine of the Church. Well, we have thousands of Christian denominations. Unlike any other religion, the Christian is divided into more segments than any other religious group that is out there. Uh, and that's the enemy, just being very effective in trying to distract people from understanding what the faith is that Jesus has given to us so that we can find salvation in Him. We, we sometimes major on our differences. And so I use that simple equation, 2 plus 2 is 4. You know, you and I, all of our listeners, we learned to count when we were kids, and we learned it by thinking about abstract, abstract uh, I'm sorry, not abstract, but concrete realities, okay? Four apples or uh, four um, you know, pieces of paper, whatever it is, we could count those things. And in time, we learned, you know, not only to add and subtract, but we learned multiplication and division. But over time, what's happened, if we think of the faith that Jesus gave us, like the number four, then over time, the Christian Church has both added to and subtracted from that faith that Jesus gave. And that's how today, 2,000 years later, we have all of these different churches, and yet 
we need to try to get back to four. Uh, you know, if we look at some of our different churches, we may say, you know, well, okay, I understand what you're saying, but it looks more to me like you're saying two plus two is 3.98, or maybe you're saying two plus two is 4.75, you know, that, that we see it's close to what we believe, because of course we think we've got it right, because uh, everything you and I believe, we, you know, hey, I, I don't believe a lie, I, you know, I recognize that, so I think I've got the truth. But we need to hold our faith loosely in our hands so that we can say, Holy Spirit, you are the one who gave the truth in Jesus, and so help me to know the truth, and whatever has been added to my faith, I give you permission to take that away. I don't want to hold on to something that's been added. And then by the same virtue, if there have been things that have been subtracted and taken away, then Lord, restore my faith to what you originally intended it to be. Wow, that's really, really good. Just tuning in, we're talking with Greg Eby. He is a pastor and author of a book called Resurrected Faith, The Heart of a Contender. Uh, Greg, you write in here with com- in your book, With Complete Surrender, Faithing Will Set You Free from the Ice-Cold Chill of Dead Faith to Fall into the Arms of Jesus. What does this kind of surrender mean for you and for me today? Well, you know, I, I thought about um, an illustration when, from my days as a youth pastor, and one of the things that we did is uh, we played a game, ready to fall, ready to catch. And so we would have young people stand up on a chair or the platform, and uh, they would turn their back to a group of six to eight friends who would cross arms behind them, and they would stand kind of closing their eyes with their arms folded in front of them, and they'd say, okay, ready to fall, and their friends would say, ready to catch, and then they would let themselves fall backwards into the arms of, uh, of their friends. And I remember a young girl who, uh, you know, got up all excited. Oh, I want to do this. I want to do this. But when she said ready to fall and then was about to go after her friend said ready to catch, she couldn't bring herself to do that. Only after she watched numerous other people do that was she willing to get back up on the chair and actually fall back into the arms of her friends. And so we need to, again, get away from that ice, chill, cold, dead faith and be willing to fall into the arms of Jesus. He will always be faithful to catch us. And, and again, it's that idea of opening our hand and saying, Lord, you know, take away those things that have been added to, add those things that have been subtracted from. I'm trusting you, Holy Spirit, to be true to Jesus' word, that you will lead and guide me in all truth. You will make Jesus known to me. And so I don't want to hold on to my traditions, my opinions as to what I think is right, I want to know you as you are, and so I trust you to do that work of faithing, that work of making my faith to come alive and be what you intended it to be all along, because that's what we can really live out. It's hard to live out our man-made traditions and doctrines, but when we have the faith that Jesus gave that, the Holy Spirit can work in us and we can live it out, and so we need to have that kind of full surrender that we're willing to just fall into his arms. Wow, that is so good. I know it's so hard for us men. We hear that word surrender. We associate it with a, a sign of weakness, but as a follower of Jesus, uh, man, surrender means strength. And uh, just love that, how Greg Eby described that there. Greg, if people want to get a copy of your book, Resurrected Faith, The Heart of a Contender, what's the best way to do that? Well, one way is you can uh, uh, visit our website, uh, firmfoundationtoday.com uh, slash books. Uh, and it, those uh, are available there. Uh, the Resurrected Faith uh, book has a companion um, study guide as well as a companion devotional book, so those are, are listed there. Uh, but it, they're also just available wherever books are sold. Uh, if by chance your local bookstore does not have one in, you can ask them and they can order it. But again, we'd be happy to uh, get you connected with a copy by visiting our webpage uh, there again at firmfoundationtoday.com. All right. Well, Greg, I've really, really enjoyed having you on. Uh, what a great, great book. Uh, blessings upon you and your ministry. If you're driving, you're like, man, I couldn't get that information down. Uh, you can go to our website, hopeishere.today. Uh, there'll be a podcast of this program. We'll have all that information he shared there. But for Greg Eby, I'm Greg Horn, and this is Hope Is Here.